saving faith. Uh, we are, of course, are in the, seri- the period of Lent. And uh, I was looking for a suitable picture to, uh, to, um, to illustrate Lent. Uh, and I'd just been praying for my good friend Len. So when this one came across, I, I didn't read Lent, I read Len. <laughs> And, and I stopped and I thought about that for a minute. I thought, in a sense, that's, that's quite right, isn't it? Because what we've got there is we've got Len and the cross. Len and the cross. And I thought, well, okay, we could take Len out and we could put uh, Alan's name, Alan and the cross, Rob and the cross, Kathy and the cross, Jean and the cross. Lent is about us facing what it meant for Christ to die and how that walk that Jesus took to Calvary impacts upon us and who we are. The, um, the reading which Jean led us in beautifully, by the way, um, focused on the, this idea of that Jesus said if we want to be his disciples, we have to take up our cross and to follow him. And that's a a very deep thing. It's about laying down something of our own desires and our own will and picking up God's will and running with that. The Apostle Paul encourages us, this is part of Lent as well, he encourages us to do a little bit of um, spiritual housekeeping, a little bit of self-examination. And he writes as follows, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourself. Well, do you not realise this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless you indeed fail the test. Just take stock. We have our yearly rhythm of Sunday services and, and, and our times of year, of Advent, Lent, Easter and Pentecost and all those sorts of things. But just stop for a second and take stock of our have we maintained this spiritual connection with God that is so deep that Paul talks about it literally that Christ is in us by his spirit are we aware of that or have we at some point just lost connection but continued going through our religious motions but without actually engaging with the reality of it. And this is pivotal, isn't it, as we've read. If anyone would come after me, let him pick up his cross, deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. How's your cross carrying doing? You know, you'd often hear people, oh, uh, you know, uh, if you were married to him, you'd know what it was like. And, but he's the cross that I have to bear, you know. That's life, isn't it? Or what I'm suffering. Um, you know, whether it be a broken leg and a, a mended hip, and it's a cross I'm having to bear at the moment. That, that's not what Jesus is really saying here. This is all about our own personal will. It is about allowing God's will to impinge on our lives where God's will actually outranks our own. We see the absolute epitome of this attitude, don't we, in the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus in his agony praise to his heavenly father that this 
cup, this cup of suffering which he was about to drink to the dregs, might be taken from him. And he's wrestling with that until he then says, but not my will, but thine be done. That's the picking up of the cross. And when we are challenged in our lives with what we like, would like to do and what we know God is telling us, that's our Gethsemane moment where we have to wrestle through to find our time of strength to yield to God's will. So part of this saving faith we have is recognising is that God is our Lord and that we have to bow our knee. I'd like to introduce you to a, a, a rather erudite looking gentleman. He's got a very fashionable beard, but he just go back a few years, about 500. His name was Peter Melanchthon. And he was um, uh, around at the same time that people like Martin Luther were. So we're talking about the Reformation time. We're talking about the 1500s. And Peter Melanchthon uh, was concerned about the state of the church where he lived, about the people and their walk of faith. <coughs> and he was concerned that he felt that for a lot of them, that their faith was what we would call these days nominal. You know, the sort of faith that... You end up in hospital and they do the forms for you and they say, religion, and the people scratch their head, put me down with C of E. C of E. Nominal. <coughs> Peter Melanchthon was concerned that he saw people who, and they had obviously to go to church each Sunday, that was the law, uh, but he didn't see changed lives. And the way that Peter uh, read the scriptures he saw that the true faith that came through the scriptures was a transforming faith that changed people from sinners into saints. Jesus is obviously concerned about this attitude as well. Um, those of you who know your Bibles well will know that the book of Revelation, before it starts off with uh, thunder and woes and scrolls and, uh, and judgment starts off with a number of letters to a number of churches. And one of the churches that Jesus sends a letter to via the Apostle John is the church of Laodicea. And the problem that Jesus has with the church at Laodicea is that this. He says, I know your deeds, that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either cold or hot. So this lukewarmness was of a concern for Jesus as well. And he uses some very um, uh, specific language. He said, because you're neither cold nor hot, I'll actually spit you out of my mouth. He said, this is, not, this is not what I want for you. When we heard um, Alison read our scripture from James, James has again the same concerns. He was seeing people who said, yes, I believe in all that we have um, been talking about. I believe this, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. I believe that he rose from the dead. Uh, and James was saying, well, hold on a minute, but I don't see any change in your life. I don't see, if you are truly repentant, I, I don't see the fruits of repentance. Do you remember when um, the scribes and Pharisees came to John the Baptist in the wilderness uh, to be baptised? And um, John the Baptist knew exactly what they like, who they were like. He said, woe to you, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath that is to come? And he really lays into them and he said, if you truly are repentant, bring forth the fruits of repentance. And Jesus says this, it is by your fruits, what you do, that people will know that you are my disciples. James is saying, 
It's not what you say, it's when you not only talk the talk, but it's when you walk the walk that we realise that if the walk is right, we recognise that the talk is actually genuine. So James was concerned that people had somehow got hold of the idea that Faith was just about believing the sort of right things. And so was Peter Melanchthon. Now, Peter, in the end, uh, wrote some things about... He, he went away and had a good chew over this idea of what is real faith. You know, the sort of faith that actually connects somebody with the living life of Christ, which actually brings about the, the life of God in you cleanses from sin which removes the guilt which transforms which regenerates which rebirths who we are and um, Peter wrote Peter Martin wrote this, these following ideas now these reckoned that were three components let's have the first one um, I'm going to teach you some Latin this morning and uh, I'm sorry about that. We used to have a saying at school, which was this, that Latin is a dead language, as dead as dead can be. First it killed the Romans, and now it's killing me. So, uh, okay. But he said this. The first aspect of true faith is notitia. Now that literally means information or content. So one of the reasons why we said the Nicene Creed this morning was that that is, if you like, the content of our faith. So saving faith is not a, just a, a nebulous thing. Faith, true faith, has content. It's not the faith on it itself that saves you. It is the faith in the person who saves you. Christ saves us. Faith has content. So it is important that we believe the truth. And Jesus says, you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. So knowing what God says is truth is an important and essential component of the faith that saves us. Now he said, added to that, there is a second component, which is called ascensus. We get the word ascent from that. And that literally means ascent, agreement, and or affirmation. So it's in, it's, it is possible to hear things like the Nicene Creed or to read your Bible. That's giving you information. And some people read things like the creeds or the scriptures and say, very interesting. Very nice. Not interested. One side. They've received the information but they haven't affirmed it. <coughs> a census is where you <coughs> give your assent. It is a commitment to it. It's where you <coughs> agree that's true. It's true. Yeah, that's right. Jesus is the Son of God. That's great. Jesus did die for my sins. That's wonderful. Jesus is coming again. It's where we, when we read the creed, we say we're saying this creed because this is what we believe, what we give assent to. <coughs> But Peter Melanchthon thought 
But that's not quite it, is it? You see, James also had this understanding. He said, okay, you've heard the gospel. You've heard the good news that the apostles have preached. And you said, yes, that's correct. And James said, but hold on a minute. Even the demons believe that. <coughs> the people the, in the New Testament, uh, when we see um, the people say, oh gosh, this is the Christ, this is the Son of the God, this is the Holy One of Israel, it's often demons who were saying that before they were cast out. Of <coughs> James said, you believe that God is one. He said, so do the demons. They're the best theologians around. And they know it. They know it's true, and they shudder. So if a demon knows the truth about who Jesus is, agrees that it's true, but of course is under judgment and will not be saved, <coughs> how do we get from there to a place of saving faith. So hopefully as you've been going, been going through this morning, you thought, yes, okay, I've got the content, we've said the creed, yes, I've heard that, I've got the information. You've been through a process where you say, yeah, well, I actually believe that. Maybe with some reservations for some of us, I don't know. But yeah, I believe that. How do we go from there to a place where that door of faith that Ed was talking about in his prayers <coughs> opens and we enter into all that Jesus has done for us? And Peter Melanchthon came up with the final one, which he called Fiduki. Fiduki. And this means trust. We've just been singing about trust. <coughs> it's where we recognise our need. We've heard the truth. We've given credence, assent to the truth. And the truth that Christ brings to us not only tells us about himself, that he is the saviour, but he also brings to us the truth that we're sinners in need of a saviour. And this fiducia is where we cast ourselves on God's mercy, where we place our unreserved trust in him to save us to make us his child and part of this leads into that place where we feel the move of the holy spirit in our lives just like good old john wesley did to gain that assurance of being a child of god John Wesley went from a place where he went to Oxford, he studied to get his degree, he got the information. He went through a process of assent where he gave his agreement to all that he'd learned to such a level that he became minister in the Church of England, which he remained to the day he died. He assented it to so much that he decided to go as a missionary to the United States to share the good news of Jesus. But nagging in his mind all the time was the fact that he didn't have this assurance, this, this knowledge, this revelation of him being a child of God, forgiven, cleansed, accepted in the beloved. And he met the Moravians who seemed to have this uh, unshakable trust in God even when the storms uh, on the Atlantic were threatening to destroy the ship and 
Wesley saw in them this fiducia that he hadn't got. And the transition that took place in his life with the warming of his heart, on, uh, which we now celebrate on Aldersgate Sunday, took him to the place where he had the third important strand, like a threefold strand which cannot easily be broken, where he suddenly gained confidence that he truly was forgiven and a child of God. So as we examine ourselves on our Lenten journey and take stock of our faith, how many strands of the three do you feel you have? I have to challenge myself. Are all my strands of saving faith wound together and intact? Or are some of them fraying a bit at the edges? And if you feel that one of the strands is missing, then seek God, for he will surely supply it to you. He will not turn aside he who or she who comes to him with a contrite and broken heart. In the scriptures, true faith is always linked with obedience. Paul talks about bringing the Gentiles to the obedience of faith linking back to that passage in James where it is by the works that you do that we see that your faith is real. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commands, obey me in the words. Love one another as I have loved you. So love, loving deeds, rather than loving feelings are the hallmarks of true faith. And a final thought for you this morning. This is my statement for you this morning. Maybe this will be true, ring true for you. I am not a Christian because I'm strong and have it all together. I am a Christian because I am weak and admit that I need a saviour. I am not a Christian because I'm strong and have it all together. I am a Christian because I am weak and admit that I need a saviour. Let's pray, shall we? <coughs> Father, we know that when we come to the light, you give us the grace to start seeing us ourselves as we really are, rather than as we would like to think we are. Father, where we are cold or just lukewarm, we ask for your forgiveness. Lord, we ask that by the power of your spirit that that flame might burn again. That we might have zeal for the house of the Lord. And Father, we Thank you that you have given us so much that we might know the truth of the gospel, of the good news of Jesus. Father, may we not just know it, but give great assent to it, claim it. And not only just give assent to it, but cast ourselves onto the truth of it in ultimate trust trusting that the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sins. Trust that the price paid by Jesus is enough to, for my forgiveness. 
trust enough to know that we will be grafted into the vine of God to have the sap of the life of the Holy Spirit flowing through our veins Father and wherever we are short in our faith Lord we ask that you liberally supply what we do not have Lord we can't drum this up this isn't something we can do of our own will and efforts but it comes by yielding to your hand Lord Jesus you told us that if we ask our Father for the Holy Spirit he will not deny it Lord may we be whole in our faith Lord in our Lenten walk may we have a spirit of candor and honesty with you and with one another and Father, may we produce the fruits of faith in our loving works with one another and to the world around us. For we pray in the name of Jesus, who although he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be held on to, but emptied himself and taking upon the form of a slave, he became obedient even to death, even a death on the cross. And therefore we know that God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every other name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Lord, in this may we walk our path, shouldering our cross, and that we may come to Calvary on Easter, knowing that we come to a place where sins are taken away and new life is given. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.